Hello and welcome to this video from the team at Dual Asset. You're here to hear about claims received on legal indemnities policies, also known as title insurance policies. This session will explore what a policy does, analyse the coverage using our own experiences and giving real examples of how, what that we have encountered in our careers. By the end, you have a greater understanding of how useful a policy is in the real estate transaction and develop a greater confidence in using such policies. For those of you new to this channel, Dual Asset is part of the Howden Group of Companies and we're a team that specialises in legal indemnity insurance, facilitating and smoothing real estate transactions. I am Wesley Timothy, Senior Underwriter at Dual Asset and I've been underwriting since the beginning of 2007. Here uh, I've been uh, exposed to various risks uh, from restrictive covenants to building regulations and easements, uh, but my peers will know me particularly um, proficient in water and drainage law. In this video you'll be hearing from my colleagues Adam Keith who's head of UK underwriting and Naomi Hare who's head of claims. So Adam and Naomi tell us a bit about yourselves. Thanks Wes, as you said my name is Adam Keith, I'm the head of UK underwriting. I started in the market in 2011 and have written just about every sort of policy that the legal indemnity market provides, both as an underwriter and a broker uh, across the, the actual world, so both globally and not just in the UK. I'm Naomi Hare, I'm Head of Claims at Dual Asset. I've worked in the legal indemnity industry since 2004. I've worked as an underwriter for about nine years and the remaining time has been spent in claims. Um, seen all sorts of things in my time at Jewel. So we handle all the claims worldwide for Jewel Asset, which means we'll see things from restitution claims in the CEE to excess fundamental W&I claims in America, as well as the UK real estate claims. Thank you both. So let's get started with our discussion. Um, and let's start with that um, elephant that's lurking in the corner of the room. Um, and that commonly, still commonly held belief that uh, the policy isn't worth the paper it's printed on or the pixels that form the PDF. Uh, after all, we never pay claims, do we? Is it money for old rope, which would mean very little effort on our part uh, in, in order to gain a, a premium very easily? Adam, what do you say about that? I would say that I would get a lot better night's sleep if that were true. Um, it's unfortunately not. Uh, legal indemnity claims are what's known in the insurance market as low frequency, high impact. That means that you get comparatively few of them, but when they do arrive, they tend to be disproportionately expensive to settle. Um, similar sort of lines would be anything involving things like natural disasters, things that are you don't expect to happen every day, but when the claim comes along, it can be quite traumatic. Now, one of the reasons that there is a belief that these policies don't pay out is because they're so infrequent. A lot of people place the policies and then move on and never come across it again. Often it's the, the buyer of the property who ends up uh, coming to us with a claim. So the, a lot of the time the people who place the policies are sellers and, and they don't see the onward transaction and the onward impact of that actual policy. And that reminds me actually of um, a time when we perhaps see a spike in claims where where the economic um, there's a downturn of some kind. For example, when we had the credit crunch, I know um, back when I used to work for First Title, as you did too, Adam, that uh, we saw an increase in in claims from from some developers who were down in tools and trying to find ways of making money. Yeah, claims can come about in just about anywhere. Uh, there is that when people are busy, they don't tend to think about too much about what their neighbours are doing. Uh, but whenever things start to slow down and things get more difficult, then yeah. You do see a, a bigger increase in these in these issues. Uh, often it's in the more controversial developments that, that tend to come to the fore at that point because people are trying to find ways of making as much money as possible in, in harder times. So projects that may have been in the back burner get moved to the front and then we end up with more claims than you would expect. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so Naomi, are you twiddling your thumbs at the moment? Well, that would be lovely but it's not actually the case. Um, we, so since day one of Dual Asset, we've had just under 500 claims, which isn't massive at all when you compare to other types of insurance or some competitors. 
but at the moment we've got 72 claims that are open which include a lot of matters that have come back to life long after we thought we'd sort of settled them we're also seeing quite an increase in the number of claims that are arising when the policy is about five six seven years old um so for you know and it's usually homeowners that would see it as money for old rope but when the property changes hands you know a neighbor that you got on quite well with might not like the new owner of the property and that is what's sparking a lot of claims recently and when you said about the downturn in the market we're definitely seeing people's attitudes changing quite considerably everyone seems more litigious these days it's starting to feel a bit like america so everyone wants to sue everyone else counter sue sue really up for a legal battle and that's quite hard to manage sometimes indeed and uh, people are much more savvy about insurance policies nowadays aren't they so whereas in the past we may have seen less claims now it may be that as people and developers as well are particularly more um, aware that this kind of cover exists they're not they don't have so much many qualms about about starting some action of some kind mm, definitely great so um Insurers do mitigate claims, don't they? Insurance is a business, a business that deals in risk and managing that risk is key to keeping going, particularly in balancing the needs of all the parties involved. So Naomi, would you agree with that and how does that work in practice? Yeah, I definitely agree. There's that underlying responsibility of us as the MGA dealing with the claims for the insurer and the insured to try and deal with a claim in the most cost effective way as we can obviously in the first instance particularly with sort of homeowner policies you want to sort of maintain the status quo ensure that they can continue to use an access or an extension that's been built in breach of covenants they can retain that because they bought the property with it you know you want to carry on enjoying that um it is sometimes difficult you will, you've also got to take into account the sort of motivations and expectations of a claimant who might not be willing to do a deal um so then you're looking more at loss in value demolition costs things like that um so it's a balancing act and it, it very much depends on all the relevant factors of the claim itself the risk that you've underwritten um the insurer's appetite a lot of the time they're happy to sort of go with our suggestions um but ultimately we we couldn't ever recommend you know settling in the court or on the steps of court with a litigious claimant when the loss in value is say twenty thousand, you you're gonna unfortunately have to go with the most sensible the the most sensible and cost effective way of resolving that claim. Hey thank you Naomi. So Adam when underwriting to what extent do you envisage what a claim might look like? So an underwriter has, has two limbs to what they look at. The first is always the actual legal risk itself and assessing that. But the second part of that is often assessing what a claim is and how a claim might come about. An underwriter will run those scenarios through their head and assign probabilities to that and also likely costs of that. So often the two main things we'll work out is what we call the, the probable maximum loss and the um, and that is working out what we're most likely situation is in a claim. The vast majority of the time that is assuming that a settlement will be achievable uh, and often adding and building in some legal costs around that to reach that settlement. And we'll also work out essentially what the worst case scenario is. So if everything went as wrong as it could, what's what's the maximum we'd be on the hook for? And that drives how we then price that risk as well. So the we were always trying to work through our heads what sort of claims we might get and the feedback from claims is incredibly valuable for underwriting. The more we understand these situations, the better we can we can price them and the better we can we can write and achieve more accurate premiums. Great, thank you. So we, we've already touched on um, the changing of, uh, of an insurer's appetite. Um, and so is that something that we, we experience quite a lot or are aware of quite a lot? And um, Adam, is it only evolving case law that causes insurers to reconsider their, their offerings? And can you give any examples of cover being withdrawn from the market? Yeah, so case law tends to move slowly, but when it changes, it can change quite dramatically. Our, our policies are all in perpetuity, they're there forever. So there's significant change in the law in the future that could expose us 
and the policies we never considered before. A good example of that is Mines and Minerals. When I first started underwriting, uh, Mines and Minerals was considered a bit of a nothing risk because nobody was approving new mines. Uh, what happened probably two years later was a case was going through the courts regarding um, Tesco and, and Baron Lonsdale in the north of England. And that came to the conclusion that by trespassing into the mineral rights, there was a claim for compensation there. Now that's triggered a massive number of claims on mines and minerals policies that we didn't underwrite at that at that time. And it also changes just the perception on the market. So mines and minerals cover has evolved massively to from what was a, a cover that we just attach on and not really think about in too much depth. And that was based around whether or not there's likelihood of mining to be something very different now similar to how we approach rights of light, there are often approach-based policies built into those policies is the cost of going to and getting releases from the likely owner of those minerals. But it's not just case law that can affect underwriting and, and it's particularly how a policy reacts. There's a, a concept which you'll hear about in insurance quite a lot called social inflation. And that's a situation where courts are now giving more favorable judgments to to individuals and claimants against large companies such as insurers. Uh, it drives up the actual cost of settling claims far higher than we would normally expect or how a lot of our policies were written in the past. So we have to take that into account and understand how these things evolve going forward. Great. And um, Naomi, it's uh, it's common for there to be a spate of claims on, on different policies, isn't it? On in different areas of cover. Um, how do you how do insurers typically react to that in your experience? So like a particular type like mines and minerals? Yeah, think, or rights to light, for example. Yeah, it definitely um we've obviously had an increase in both types, both those types of claims in the last couple of years, and it certainly sort of flagged things up with the, obviously the people that the insurers that we deal with aren't necessarily going to have much oversight from the underwriting perspective so it sets, sets off sort of a a red flag or internal discussion at their end um but often it's sort of perhaps sort of a lack of understanding about our underwriting approach so i did have a discussion with an insurer before christmas where it was basically sort of taking them through the various cases they wanted to talk about and why we saw the positives of the risk. Obviously, once you get to the claim stage, there is only negative. And it's easy in hindsight to say, well, why did you underwrite this? And from a claims perspective, we might also feel like that, but also with our own underwriting experience, we can see, well, these are the things that the underwriter looked at, they were happy with, and the claim often comes from an unexpected or a, a sort of um, a different angle that you can't always anticipate at the underwriting stage because again yeah. you're dealing with all claimants even entities corporate entities are compiled of human beings with their own motivations and expectations so yeah yeah good thank you yeah and so so speaking about how you deal with a, a claim so a claim on the same subject matter, again, perhaps mineral or rights to light or, or any other topic, um, would you deal with it in the same formula each time? Um, and what factors make a, for a different approach in solving an issue? I think you've touched on it there when you've speak, spoken about uh, personalities. Yeah, so that's obviously, that's your sort of variable element to the approach. We will have, it will depend on the case that's been underwritten a lot of the time there's going to be a lot of tick boxes you know this 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 and that and this is how we'll deal with the claim because that's how we usually see them being resolved so we'll have a similar approach it will usually be defend if we can and then maybe alongside that or instead of try and negotiate with the claimant um, to get a negotiated settlement and again go back to that point about maintaining the status quo obviously there's a title defect you've got the insurance hopefully the insurance can resolve the matter and allow you to continue to live in your house as you were or develop the site as you'd planned um, it really is that third party unknown I mean we do obviously keep a record of what we call active beneficiaries so there are people and corporations that we're aware of um, at the underwriting stage and whose motivations 
you can kind of anticipate at the underwriting stage but obviously that list grows because more people come out and might have lots of land holding in certain areas that could affect future underwriting so um, for the most part we will try and follow a similar structure depending on the risk and sometimes there's overlap across risks like I said so defend defend and negotiate negotiate um, but trying to suss out the claimant early early doors is quite important to how your approach and formula is going to work out sometimes people change halfway through we've had that on the claim last year that we settled just before christmas we got so far and things sort of went wildly off off the table and then got worse as we got towards settlement um and we ended up sort of settling at a subpar level but you know it allowed the insured to continue with their development as they'd planned it just wasn't as good as it's looked at the beginning um yeah it's that unknown third party element really that can skew how you deal with a claim great great and that's one thing we can't underwrite i mean i've been surprised many times by underwriting what i think to be a simple belt and braces cover and uh, only to be surprised by um by a particular personality in the neighborhood a few months later Okay, so we've touched on on um, uh, various ways of, of curing a, a claim, of, of dealing with that process. Um, and there are numerous ways, of, as you've just said, of, of doing that. Uh, however, I, sometimes it is with a heavy heart, we, we simply have to pay loss in market value. That is far, by far the best route to, to solve uh, a particular claim. And we've seen many cases in the media uh, where a boundary dispute, for example, uh, far exceeds the monetary value of a piece of, of land. And if you wouldn't mind in, indulging me, I'll just quote some uh, case law here. One, one is a speech from uh, Lord Hoffman in a case I used to lecture on, uh, Adam Will Wibberley and uh, Inslee, uh, where he say he quotes some... Um, it makes a reference to Shakespeare, actually, which is why I quite enjoy it. Boundary disputes are a particularly painful form of litigation. Feelings run high and disproportionate amounts of money are spent. Claims to small and valuous pieces of land are pressed with the zeal of Fortinbras' army, which I, I think kind of sums up what, what you've been saying as well in terms of what we get when individual personalities come to the fore in these kind of cases. And But interestingly to me, this was uh, kind of echoed in a speech by Lord Justice Briggs in uh, Palmer and Upton, who, uh, who, who cites, also cites Hamlet uh, by saying, while to, my, while to my shame I see the imminent death of 20,000 men that, for a fantasy and trick of fame, go to their graves like beds fight for a plot whereon the numbers cannot try the case which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain oh from this time forth my thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth so it seems to me Shakespeare tend to base a lot of his tragedies on uh, boundary disputes <laughs> so back to the back to the gist of what we're doing have you Naomi got any um, examples where market value is is the obvious choice of uh, solving a claim um yes and as you said earlier it does it, your heart does sink sometimes often if you've been trying to negotiate um with a claimant you almost there's been a, a few occasions where we've said look we're insurer backed we'll give you what what you want just give us an easement or allow us to maintain our extension which was built in breach of covenants but sometimes it's either just a flat no from the claimant or from that mitigation point it's just a it's going to be so much cheaper because indemnity is compensating the insured for the loss of something that they had and if the value of that asset is ten thousand pounds there's absolutely no way we can justify to the insurers to spend fifty thousand litigating on that point or even paying the claimant forty thousand you know, some, sometimes if there's a very small buffer, we might recommend, you know, it's only worth 15, the claimant will take 20. We think the best resolution is going to be paying that 20,000. But um, early on, so when we sort of assess claims, I mean, pedestrian access claims are going to be the easiest example for this piece. If it's a secondary access to the back of your property, it's probably not going to hold a great deal of value to the overall value of the property. So 
we tend to get evaluation early on to sort of provide a context for how we'll deal with that claim, similar to adverse possession as well. Um, we like to know the value of what we're trying to negotiate for um, because we don't we don't want to spend twenty thousand pounds and then work out at that point that it's only worth ten fifteen. So um, loss in value we and we do try and tell people quite early on because our experience has shown how upset people can get when we've got to the point where we can only settle for loss in value. We try and manage those expectations in our initial coverage letter where we say what we're going to do throughout the life of the claim if we can anticipate that but ultimately say we can't guarantee this will work and it might be that we have to compensate you for loss in value. Thanks Naomi. So how would you typically calculate uh, what the drop in market value will actually be as a result of, um, of conceding a claim? Okay, so at the point where we decide that a uh, valuation is required, we will either directly or via the insured or their solicitor uh, obtain a the cert will retain the services of a RIC surveyor to carry out a red book valuation of the property. And for the contentious cases, we will tend to get two valuations to compare if we expect to have some argument about what the figure actually is, but always at least one, it will be a professional report. And the basis for those instructions are gonna be the unencumbered value. So the open market value of the property, assuming there's no risk burdening the title specific to what we've insured. So access, for example, full rights of access. Um, and that will sit against the encumbered value. So if we are a position where we have to concede vehicular access to the property, it's going to be the value again on the open market on the basis that there's no vehicular access to and from the property. And then the difference between those two figures is your diminution, your loss in value. And that is what this sort of, what we refer to as the catastrophic loss is going to be. It's not always catastrophic. Again, I went back to earlier about what the relative value of the asset or easement is going to be. Um, but it's, yeah, so it's going to be an expert report and it's either at the start, so it frames how we deal with the claim or perhaps even negotiations with the claimant. Um, we've had a couple of claims where we've sort of reached the point where we're going to compensate the insured. And once we get that figure, we'll say to the insured, right, this is the figure. Why don't you offer this to the claimant? Because that's if we're going to pay out two hundred thousand, it's going to be better for the insured if we pay that two hundred thousand to the neighbour to allow them to cross their land for access, than paying them loss in value, and they lose that access. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. So, um, although legally a risk can sound pretty dire, it's not often the case, or the case at all, that. Um, with the crystallisation of that risk means the land becomes this whopping great black hole with no other use whatsoever. There's always some other kind of use that that uh, that, that that we can we can make of that piece of land. So so Adam, if if the drop in market value is the true test of what is at risk, then why does our market ensure for the full value of the property or the or the gross developed value if we're if we're building something new? So that is a, primarily a convention based on pricing and everyone works off that because that's how the market priced for many years. It, to be honest with you, it's not particularly accurate or something that, that we Jill like doing all the time. Uh, you can get these people insuring for 800 million, 900 million values, which are never going to be the loss, it's just simply not there. A lot of the times the, the actual risk only affects a small part of the site, but they'll ensure the entire site, despite the fact that the, the drop in market value is going to be much smaller. Those type of policies where the estimation has been made on how much they need to insure for are called first loss policies. And the, the only problems ever arise is in how we price, because we know the full value of the site's never at risk. Our pricing models are based on that assumption. And we work out our maximum losses based on that amount and, and how much we, we believe is at risk. So when someone comes to us wanting to insure, say, a site that's worth 800 million, but only wants to insure 20 million, because that's the, the estimation that they think that they're exposed to, we're happy to do that, but we just need people to tell us up front that that's what they're doing so we can price it accordingly and we can write the policy so it, it takes 
that into account. Uh, there are plenty of situations where that is far more appropriate than usually on these larger sites. And that is the only way for this to, to actually work. But most insurers work on the basis that that full value is never at risk. And as we said, it's just a convention that comes about from years of, of this market doing the same thing. So it's worst case scenario and covering um, a, a risk, even yeah. though conceivably it won't won't ever get to that extent. Yeah, it's one of those one of those things that if you're the one who's making the the call for the client or the client's making the decision of how much cover they want, it is better to be on the safe side. Uh, you don't want to get there and go, well, we estimated the claim to be 10 million and we only insured for 10 million, uh, but the claims actually worked out as 12 million. Well, your client's 2 million out of pocket. Is that a... But, but the idea of these policies to, is to try and remove the financial risk. So there is a confusion of why you would then create a financial risk by potentially underinsuring and at a guess of what could go wrong. Uh, like we said, very few people get much experience of these legal indemnity claims. We are the ones who say the most of them. And if you're making a guess of how much that claim is going to settle, I'm sure now we could pull a file out that says that it's actually far more than that. <laughs> uh, and it happens. It does happen. One of the things that our policies do as well is essentially that legal expenses often do a lot of the damage. And so our policies cover legal expenses in addition to the policy amount. But if you're insuring for the full value of the property with someone who doesn't include that legal expenses cover, you're potentially underinsuring because if you lose the full value, you will have spent legal fees and professional fees getting to that point. That's again, you'd be out of pocket and that sort of thing. So you do need to make proper decisions on whether or not to be completely safe and fully protected or to run that potential risk. It's usually a very small and remote risk. It's often unlikely that these claims occur in the first instance. So the chance that it occurs and then it's much higher than what you insured for. Again, it's unlikely, but it can happen. And it's a question of, do you save that much in premium by, by doing that? And the reality is probably not. Great. Thanks, Adam. And that actually leads, leads me neatly into the next um, next point. So we've spoken about uh, loss in value, but what other kind of losses uh, should be dealt with by a legal indemnity policy? Um, so legal costs, as you quite rightly raise there, um, perhaps damages to an insured, uh, sorry, an injured third party is the usual kind of loss we might see uh, should a restrictive covenant case get to the lands tribunal, for example. So, so Adam, in terms of those legal fees, um, how do you assess the potential cost um, uh, that a claim might bring when when assessing cover? How do you make that calculation? So, as I, as I sort of mentioned earlier, when the underwriters looking at these cases, part of that is assessing how a claim might come about. And it's working out how you would go about settling that claim, the cost, the time, the expense. Obviously, we've got great amount of data from the claims team on how much legal expenses usually are incurred. Uh, and we often add a bit more onto that to be on the safe side because you never know if you get a particularly tricky one or one of the situations that Naomi described where you've got someone who just isn't in a rush or wants to go back and renegotiate it when you thought you've got to a settlement that, that starts adding up those legal costs. So legal costs and settlement costs are kind of where we sort of price our actual potential maximum losses that we've decided that that amount and we price that into the policy and, and the understanding that a certain, only a certain percentage of these will like, come to an actual claim but we have to build in that that sort of worry that you're going to get a particularly litigious claimant who will want their legal fees paid for a lot of the time as well so I mean you look demographically around are you going to be dealing with a high street law firm or are you going to be dealing with a sophisticated landowner with a very expensive legal team who will want their costs covered as well in uh, to get any, any agreement for a release. So it's understanding the potential claimants and pricing that into the policy is, is really important. Great, thank you. So, so Naomi, Adam has already um, touched on the, the fact that uh, the importance of checking whether the policy that an insured has uh, causes the fighting fund to diminish as that battle rages. Um, is it your aim to sort out a claim as, as quickly as possible to minimise those costs? And what's the average amount of time to deal with a case? That is a tricky question to answer because no two claims are ever the same. And so I think there's sort of a misconception that 
a claim that is settled within three months is going to be cheaper than a claim that's settled in 12 months because obviously it depends on as adam said the law firms that are involved you know the area that the property or asset is in um obviously we want to get claims settled without any unnecessary delay but sometimes it's just not that simple there could be a lot of back and forth between the two sides especially if you're trying to defend a claim there's a lot of evidence gathering um obviously we're conscious of the fact that on the majority of claims especially where authorized expenses are sort of a separate line of insurance on top of the le the indemnity pot you know that's that isn't diminishing the insurer's lifetime risk on that policy which is the policy limit itself so we do have to bear that in mind and obviously from a fees perspective you want it to be done not, not quickly isn't always the way to keep those costs down it's without unnecessary um back and forth with an expensive lawyer or even using an expensive lawyer if you're looking at the insured's um appointed legal representative you don't want to be using a partner in a london firm to deal with something in a rural cornwall you know it all has to be relative and managed as well as it can be great thank you Thanks both. So we've discussed um, drops in market value, but what about the the simple cost of putting something right? Uh, for example, the spend required to demolish some works that aren't compliant with the legal issue. So Naomi, how would that work in practice? So I suppose where we see that the most, it's going to be probably sort of planning and building regulations risks, unauthorised extensions. Um, I don't think I've ever handled anything where we've actually had to demolish anything but obviously that is covered by the policy if you, there was a single story extension that didn't comply with building regulations and no amount of works could put it right because building regulations are there for health and safety reasons so if you if what you've got doesn't comply it doesn't matter how long it's been there if it's unsafe you need to do something to it and if that's knocking it down that cost is going to be covered by the policy um and similarly, that same example could apply to covenants. So if the covenantee doesn't want your extension to carry on, you're going to have to demolish it. And that cost is going to be covered under that head of loss in the policy. As well as the, the drop in market value that uh, yeah. corresponds with that. Yeah. OK, Adam, so I presume that is something that's factored in when you're assessing risk where, where it's practical to do so. Yes, where, where it's practical is a is a very key word there. Uh, you can't sit there and look at every uh, building regulation policy that we might uh, issue and, and try to work out exactly how much that would have cost to settle. Uh, I have in the past, in a particularly challenging listed building insurance that we were looking at, uh, where some windows have been put in that many years ago that were not compliant. I did put a, a job advert out on one of the, the apps to see exactly what the sort of re reasonable cost would be of changing the windows in the event of a claim. Uh, so you can use that and you can factor it in, but a lot of the time it's not as practical. Uh, it's very hard to know exactly what you would have to do to put one of these right. Like, and we said the planning and building regs it can be as simple as changing something, but it might be actually something fundamentally hard it might be something internal that means that we've got to re-change the entire property and you can't make very accurate judgments of that. So what we've got to take a look at is what have our complaint, our claims experience has been over the, the wider course of, of this product and what is the average sort of cost on that and then maybe add a bit more if it's particularly risky or if it's something particularly tricky or unusual that you might have to put right. But yes, we would assess that. Again, when the underwriter is running through every scenario that they can think of that's one of the ones that they will often check though as Naomi did say earlier often these claims come about from very strange angles that aren't necessarily one that the underwriter has considered because no one saw that chain of events coming <laughs> great thank you so already we've seen that no one claim will ever fit squarely into one element of of the wide cover that's provided but but what other kinds of costs might we see so Naomi how about a, a builder who has got a contractual obligation to get works done within a particular time scale what what kind of costs can arise out of those and and, and are they covered so depend like like you say are they covered that's going to depend on whether that's a standard head of term or an additional head of term in the policy um 
but if the insurer has instructed you to down tools to deal with a claim and a contract's already started and you there's a construction timetable to meet then the policy is going to cover the delay costs every time a deadline isn't met until the claim is resolved uh, so that is going to be covered the contractual cost there's got to be a contract and it's got to have been factored into the policy either as i said as a standard head of term or additional head of term and it's got to have been from the insurer saying to down tools so if you've made the choice to stop work without that instruction coming from us then that's not necessarily going to be picked up it might be something we will be happy to have a conversation about um we do try and deal with claims in quite a pragmatic way where possible but strictly speaking it's going to be those three things applying Great. That's a, and that's a really interesting point you make there, because uh, in, as in any form of insurance, by downing tools, we're kind of admitting some kind of liability, aren't we? Which is the last thing you want to do. Really, we want to carry on uh, with whatever works are being undertaken uh, and then have the legal argument behind the scenes. Yeah, it's it's a balancing act. You could you could see it as. Um, an admission of liability. I think it's from the insurer's perspective, it's less about that and more about that being a trigger for costs. So if the insurer is said to do it, then they're on, which is why we will hold off until it's absolutely necessary to do that. But also from a conduct perspective, it, it demonstrates that you are willing to hear the claimant out. And if we think that they're making a good case and it could harm our long-term um, claim handling prospects and settlement options then um we're going to say down tools don't just carry on regardless and i can't recall the case but it was a a covenants case not that long ago where the developer just carried on regardless and the judge told them to demolish everything that had been built there's a couple of cases actually um, well, that, that, one, that case is actually really interesting because that is it millgate the, yeah, Millgate is a, an area where they had to demolish uh, the affordable housing, which meant they lost planning on a much more profitable scheme yeah. nearby. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that case, very much like Rides of Light as well, conduct is king. And it's yeah. the idea that we just plow ahead with the development wouldn't stand us in good stead unless we were certain we were going to get a settlement or that uh, it would work out in the end. Because a lot of the time the courts will look at us and go, you've developed without taking any account of this person's legal right or trying to settle or trying to resolve it in a friendly and amicable manner, they will mm. come down hard on you. We mentioned social inflation earlier, and that's a similar factor to this. Mm. The, the actions that you take are important when it comes to a judgment in court. Yeah, really good point. So neighbourly behaviour is certainly something that is that has been knocking around in the case law for some years, but is really at the fore at the moment. Excellent. Thanks. So, so Adam, when we're so, for example, this kind of situation happens, uh, and we've got to go back to the drawing board, would the cost of submitting a new planning application be covered? So it's a it's an interesting one. Naomi made the point that it depends what's been included in the policy. So, uh, under a JR policy, yes, always, because that's the easiest way to resolve a claim would be to get the new planning permission with a defect that caused the JR in the first instance. Um, if that is a way of resolving the claim, then we might look at it under something we want to do, but it may be something that needs to be tied in. One of the big things that, taking it slightly off piece from this question, that, but it has sort of been raised in this area, is that a lot of people take out policies with the assumption that it's going to react to cover the situation, regardless of what, what it actually needs, what they require. A good example of that is people who have short leases on properties and commercial properties take out a diminution and loss policy. And don't think about the fact that actually there isn't really a diminution in value of the, of the property for someone who has a short lease. It's that they're locked into a rental payment that they can't use or function a business from uh, because of, of the insured event. There's things like delay costs that, as Naomi said, unless it's fully in contract and it's built in there, we're not going to want to pay those sort of things unless we've specifically told you to stop. Um, consequential losses that bounce off that, for example, if you can't open 
the shop or the shop can't run, but you've still contracted to pay wages of staff and everything like that. Those aren't considered by a standard legal indemnity product that you just pick up off the shelf. You need to negotiate those into the contract itself to make sure that it's covering exactly what's right for your client. We aren't psychic in that sort of sense. We can't say, oh, well, you, you've told us you want a policy to cover this property here. Here it is that covers everything that you could possibly need because we understand your client's business inside out that we don't, you do. The, the client understands that they know what losses they might be on for. If you're picking the one size fits all off the shelf, it's not going to do that. It's it's supposed to be a starting point. It often worries me when I send a draft policy out and the person says, yes, you put that on risk. And we really considered that that's going to cover what it is. So I've taken a best guess as an underwriter, but it's almost I'm expecting changes to come back. And when they don't, it's a, it can be a very concerning situation of whether anyone actually read what's included in the loss in the policy. Yeah, that, that's a key point as well, isn't it? So where where whoever is arranging the policy um, uh, understands the value of it and, and what it does for that particular transaction that they're dealing with at the time, um, is that going to be communicated to the to the ultimate person who owns the, the policy? I mean, this is, the, this is probably the biggest challenge we face in insurance is the transfer of information from the insured to the actual insurer themselves to understand exactly of what we need to be covered if you get into a claim in these situations the worst thing you want to come across is going to realize the policy doesn't do anything that it's supposed to do for you that it doesn't meet your expectations and that's going to fall on the responsibility of the person who arranged that and their probably professional indemnity cover because they've they've said that this policy covers them and it necessarily doesn't it, it's not something that we can particularly in commercial policies we can't assume they're going to need this head of law so they they want this type of cover it's it's not practical in terms of an underwriting point of view we'll always send out a first and best guess and then expect them to include what they need great and on that point i've i've been aware over my career of some very unusual claims being made on uh, some of our coverage for example there was one occasion where we'd we'd um, we'd provided cover for drainage rights so there was a lack of drainage easement on the property and the insured phoned the claims team uh, at the time not Naomi's uh, at this point it was um, asking for the gutters to be cleaned out <laughs> uh, have you got many of those Naomi oh we I mean it does tend to be the building regulations policies that attract the highest number of claims and queries again it's about point of sale isn't it and how much advice has been given at the time given how fast paced conveyancing is particularly of resi properties there's not great a great deal of time to go through a policy and say what is and isn't covered and however sort of clear we think we might make it in the policy we still get calls about you know windows that don't close properly doors that don't fit the frame I had someone call a previous employer because rats were coming up the drain pipe into the bathroom they had a building regs policy um so yeah it's usually the wild claims that are made against policies that have nothing to do with that particular issue um that are the interesting ones the you you, you think you've heard all the reasons why someone might want to make a claim on a building regs policy and then you get another call and you're like hmm, didn't actually see that one coming but yeah well thank you very much both so how about uh, you tell us some more about one of the most interesting or fascinating cases you've come across so far? Adam. So for me, the most interesting uh, thing about this job is that, that you never really get two days the same. All the risks that you see, while fundamentally similar type, they all come with different quirks and something unusual. I think for me, underwriting wise, it is finding out about strange old and particularly ancient laws that that still affect modern day so before i started underwriting i had no idea that there were islands off the coast of scotland where danish law still has some primacy and effect uh, there are parts of of ireland and northern ireland where old celtic law is still in effect and can still cause issues uh, probably one of my favorite cases that we've underwritten recently uh, involved a site in london which is built on an old graveyard where the, the people the bodies had been removed when the, when the site was developed but technically when they were redeveloping it there was a chance that they may still be someone there who was unrecorded at the time and it might be that somebody comes forward in the future to say that that's one of their relatives and they 
under the burial act that essentially means that th th that building has to be removed and has to be restored back to back to a burial ground so yeah i love those sort of cases where you get those old bits you've got streets in london that if they predated the great fire are uh, actually owned by the city of london they're called charter streets and fascinating to find out all these little quirks and they still cause issues for modern developments and and just general life in london probably one of the the more remarkable ones is there's a there's a skyscraper in in london which is built on land that nobody knows who owns it it's been unowned for close to 400 years nobody can trace who owns this area of land and there is a possibility that someone could come in the future and say this is my area of land get your skyscraper off of it yeah there are some i mean i remember a few years ago not so long ago actually but when when Lambertry sold their headquarters um in London, um, I think to the London School of Economics, uh, during the during that transaction, they realised there were parts of the Lambertry building that were unregistered. <laughs> I thought it was particularly fascinating. Um, how, Naomi, how about you? I did try and rack my brains, but I think what stands out for me the most is people's capacity for drama and litigation. I'm, I think I get to a point in my career where I've seen the most contentious argument, usually between neighbours, usually about access. And then people come along who are just just so unwilling to be neighbourly um, and will battle to the death, to go back to Shakespeare, over, um, you know, such little matters, you know, a shared passageway and people will spend thousands and thousands arguing about it and won't see reason or try and think of it you know approach it logically and I think it, for us it's difficult because we're not emotionally tied to the property or the dispute itself and so that's what drives it but um it's always sort of people's unwillingness to be reasonable which fascinates me and how sometimes no amount of money will get them to a position where they're willing to concede the point and I find that frustrating sometimes I, I like I like the claimants whose MO is just to make money because you know where you are then and it's just a horse deal you're just yeah. trying to negotiate that settlement figure and and they're easier to manage I think than the people you can't suss them out what they want and no amount of money will 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 get them to concede the point because they're so entrenched in their own principles <clears throat> often with changes of use and new developments on their doorstep you know the sort of nimby character and you think you're also on a new estate but you don't want any more new estates around you and the more new estates you'll get more nimbies but yeah it's people <laughs> i think for me <laughs> human always beings reminds, always reminds me that people move to areas where there are like, nice clubs and then get clubs shut down because it's too noisy at night yeah you made yeah. there. <laughs> you made that decision. Great, thank you both. So I think we've covered an awful lot of the ground there, but still only really scratched the surface. Um, but going back to our first discussion, hopefully um, to the, for the audience, we've we've demonstrated that claims are paid uh, under legal indemnity policies, uh, perhaps not as often as motor insurance, for example, but significantly more expensive. And Naomi, I know for a fact that um, I, my my underwriting files have definitely kept you busy in recent years. Um, but from our point of view, we do welcome those claims, don't we? Well, as someone who really enjoys receiving a salary every month, I definitely welcome claims. And I do love seeing your claims, Wes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think they're a great tool for testing your policy wordings, your underwriting philosophies. Um, you know, you'll see things from the front end, like we said earlier, you can't anticipate this sort of unknown and through claims you learn about the different ways that the dispute can be sort of brought to life and, you know, how your policy wording, when we write our policy wordings, we think a claim will happen in a certain way and it's quite progressive. So I think it's a really good way for everyone to learn, really. I mean, I, you know, still after 19 years will learn things that I didn't know before because a claim happened in a different way than you'd expect at the underwriting stage or even the first stage of the claim. So we definitely welcome claims um, and we can we can say hand on heart, we pay claims. And while we might not have as many claims as a motor insurer, you know, 
they do happen and they are costly and they are you know it's difficult when you're talking to an insured and their claim is being declined and trying to explain why the policy had value for money at the transaction stage they don't care about that that's in the past um but it does it has a transactional value and then it has a value when the claim happens inevitably at any point we had a claim recently after eight years after the policy was issued so you know it could happen at any time great great yeah so um i i mean i i've obviously had claims on my files over the many years i've been underwriting and um i i know that uh, when i had my first few I, I felt rather sick about it um but the, the but the uh, to my point of view the true test is whether i've followed the procedures and i've um, and i've made sure that uh, that a claim has arisen can be be dealt with in the way I might have anticipated. As Adams clarified earlier, that's not always the case, and we're often surprised how things come up. But but Adam, similarly, what is your feeling uh, or first thoughts when uh, you get a claim underway on one of your cases? Yeah, uh, well, a lot of that for an underwriter's ex experience. So you, every underwriter should have claims. It's, it's it'd be strange if you didn't. I'd be worried that they weren't underwriting close enough to. The line of where we should be operating if you're only underwriting things that never end up with a claim you're not really you're not doing anything great for the business i think i remember my first claim at, at jewel being a rather panicked affair and then looking up the file checking whether or not what i'd done wrong that ended up getting there and find out it was a chance of repair claim which was it still incredibly rare and i still don't know how i managed to get that i think i ended up having two chance of repair claims which is fairly remarkable um but that's always the worry is what did I get wrong there and then finding out the strange chain of events that led to that claim you're going oh absolutely no idea how I could have seen that coming but have I and the, the thing for the underwriter is always have I calculated my losses correctly have I properly cured for this is the carrier happy with how I've done this and you will get claims that you can underwrite the most perfect file it could be the easiest looking risk and that could be a claim I have got numerous cases that have kept me awake at night that have never turned into a claim things that I've as soon as I've issued the policy I've gone that's oh, going to be a claim tomorrow I better start looking for a job and then <laughs> never comes up never comes up and it's absolutely fine and then you'll underwrite something that is run of the mill that you've done a million times before and because somebody cut down a tree in their back garden someone's got upset and somehow that spiraled into a multi-million restrictive covenant claim of some form it's a it's an unusual, unusual world. And I think in underwriting, you've, you've got to accept the claims are happen and claims are our best tool for showing that the product does what it's supposed to. We need to, if you didn't have claims, this product wouldn't exist. We said that at the start. So we need to know the claims happen. And the more claims we have, the more data, the more we can underwrite, the better we can reserve, the better we can accurately predict our losses and the better for the insurer and the better for the insured, because then we can accurately charge premiums so the more claims you have, the more accurate the premium is in fact. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean expensive because if you've written 10,000 policies and you get one claim and that one claim ends up to be settled for far less, you can reduce the price on those policies and say that well, actually we don't need as much money to cover that pool of risk. We can we can charge this client less because they're bringing less to the risk pool and accurately charge premiums towards the higher end risks, uh, the ones that do cause the claims, so the access being a probably a very common one I think we probably see the most of. Brilliant well thank you both uh, for your time and thank you to our, our viewers we hope you found this discussion useful and at least taken one point away from it or one lesson that uh, you won't have uh, learned before uh, and it's our hope to run some future sessions covering some of the claims we're working on uh, so obviously Naomi being uh, predominant for, for those uh, and how we've resolved them because they, they will continue to happen. Uh, the law changes, appetites change, etc. So if there's any particular issues you'd like to hear more about, please do let us know. Uh, but like I say, thank you to Naomi and thank you to, to Adam. And um, uh, I hope you found this useful. Thank you.